neat, the icy chill racing through the serene, dippity-doo suburban community. All the other families doing the most ironic thing, locking their doors, locking themselves in together. Around midnight, he realized that his little family had gone to bed without him. No one had even bothered to call down to him. They didn't care. A hollow roar was starting inside his head. He needed about a half dozen new prints to stop the white noise for a while. Maybe he would torch the perfect little house on Central Avenue. Torching houses was good for the soul. He'd done it before. He'd do it again. God, his whole skull ached as if somebody'd been hitting it with a ball-peen hammer. Was something physically the matter with him? Was it possible he was going mad this time? He tried to think about the lone eagle, Charles Lindbergh. That didn't work either. In his mind, he revisited the farmhouse in Hopewell Junction. No good. That mind trip was getting old, too. He was world famous himself, for Christ's sakes. He was famous now. Everybody in the world knew about him. He was a media star all over planet Earth. He finally left the cellar and then the house in Wilmington. It was just past 5.30 in the morning. As he walked outside to the car, he felt like an animal, suddenly on the loose. He drove back to D.C. There was more work to do there. He didn't want his public to be disappointed, did he? He thought he had a treat for everyone now. Don't get comfortable with me. Around 11 that morning, Tuesday... Gary Murphy lightly tapped the front doorbell of a well-kept brick townhouse on the edge of Capitol Hill. Bing bong, went a polite door chime inside. The sheer danger of the situation, of his being in Washington again, gave him a nice chill. This was a lot better than being in hiding. He felt alive again. He could breathe. He had his own space. Vivian Kim kept the lock chain on, but she opened the door about a foot. She'd seen the familiar uniform of Washington's Pepco Public Utility Service through the peephole. Pretty lady, Gary remembered from the Washington Day School. Long black braids, cute little upturned nose. She clearly didn't recognize him as a blonde. No mustache, little flesh off the cheeks and chin. Yes, what is it? Can I help you? She asked the man standing on her porch. Inside the house, jazzy music was playing. Thelonious. I hope it's the other way around, he smiled pleasantly. Somebody called about an overcharge on the electric. Vivian Kim frowned and shook her head. She had a tiny map of Korea hanging from rawhide around her neck. I didn't call anybody. I know I didn't call Pepco. Well, somebody called us, miss. Come back some other time, Vivian Kim told him. Maybe my boyfriend called. You'll have to come back. I'm sorry. Gary shrugged his shoulders. This was so delicious, he didn't want it to end. I guess you can call us again if you like, he said. Get on a schedule again. It's an overcharge, though. You paid too much. Okay. I hear you. I understand. Vivian Kim slowly stripped away the chain and opened the door. Gary stepped into the apartment. He pulled a long hunting knife from under his work jacket. He pointed it at the teacher's face. Don't scream. Do not scream, Vivian. How do you know my name, she asked. Who are you? Don't raise your voice, Vivian. There's no reason to be afraid. I've done this before. I'm just your garden variety robber. What do you want? The teacher had begun to tremble. Gary thought for a second before he answered her scared rabbit question. I want to send out another message over the TV, I guess. I want the fame I so richly deserve, he finally said. I want to be the scariest man in America. That's why I work in the Capitol. I'm Gary. Don't you remember me, Viv? Chapter 34 Samson and I raced down C Street in the heart of Capitol Hill. I could hear the breath inside of my nose as I ran. My arms and legs felt disjointed. Squad cars from the department and EMS ambulances had the street completely blocked off. We'd had to park on F Street and sprint the last couple of blocks. 
WJLA-TV was already there. So was CNN. Sirens screamed everywhere. I spotted a click of reporters up ahead. They saw Samson and me coming. We're about as hard to miss as the Harlem Globetrotters in Tokyo. Detective Cross? Dr. Cross? The reporters called out, trying to slow us down. No comment. I waved them off. From either of us. Get the fuck out of the way. Inside Vivian Kim's apartment, Samson and I passed all the familiar faces. Techies, forensics, the DOA gang in their ghoulish element. I don't want to do this anymore, Samson said. Whole world's flowing down the piss tubes. It's too much. Even for me. We burn out, I mumbled to him. We burn out together. Samson grabbed my hand and held it. That told me he was as fucked up about this as he got. We went inside the first bedroom on the right side of the hallway. I tried to be still inside. I couldn't do it. Vivian Kim's bedroom was beautifully laid out. Lots of exquisite black and white family photographs and art posters covered most of the wall space. An antique violin was hung over one wall. I didn't want to look at the reason I was there. Finally, I had to. Vivian Kim was pinned to the bed with a long hunting knife. It was driven through her stomach. Both her breasts had been removed. Her pubic hair had been shaved. Her eyes had rolled back in her head as if she had seen something unfathomable during her last moments. I let my eyes wander around the bedroom. I couldn't look at Vivian Kim's mutilated body. I stared at a splash of bright color on the floor. I caught my breath. Nobody had said anything about it on the way up. Nobody had noticed the most important clue. Fortunately, nobody had moved the evidence. Look at this here, I showed Samson. Maggie Rose Dunn's second sneaker was lying on Vivian Kim's bedroom floor. The killer was leaving what the pathologists call artistic touches. He left an overt message this time, the signature of signatures. I was shaking as I bent down over the little girl's sneaker. Here was the most sadistic humor at work, the pink sneaker, in shocking contrast to the bloody crime scene. Gary Sinigi had been in the bedroom. Sinigi was the project killer, too. He was the thing. And he was back in town. Chapter 35 Gary Sinigi was still in Washington, indeed. He was sending out special delivery messages to his fans. There was a difference now. He was baiting us, too. Samson and I got a dispensation from the jefe. We could work on the kidnapping as long as it was linked to the other murder investigations. It definitely was. This is our day off, so we must be having fun, Samson said to me as we walked the streets of Southeast. It was the 13th of January. Bitter cold. Folks had fires blazing in the garbage cans on almost every street corner. One of the brothers had, fuck you too, razor cut on the back of his head. My sentiments exactly. Maya Monroe doesn't call anymore. Doesn't write, I said to Samson. I watched my breath launch clouds in the freezing air. See, there is a silver lining, he said into the wind. He'll come around when we catch the thing. He'll be there to take all the bows for us. We walked along, goofing on the situation and on each other. Samson rapped lyrics from pop songs, something he does a lot. That morning it was, now that we've found love, Heavy D and the boys, rev me up, rev me up, you're my little buttercup, Samson kept saying, as if the lyrics made sense out of everything. We were canvassing Vivian Kim's neighborhood, which was on the edge of Southeast. Canvassing a neighborhood is mind-numbing work, even for the young and uninitiated. Did you see anyone or anything unusual yesterday? We asked anybody dumb enough to open their doors for us. Did you notice any strangers, strange cars, anything that sticks out in your mind? Let us decide whether it's important. As usual, nobody had seen a thing. Nada de nada. Nobody was happy to see us either, especially as we moved into southeast on our canvas. To top it off, the temperature was about three degrees with the wind chill. It was sleeting. The streets and sidewalks were covered with icy slush. 
A couple of times we joined the street people warming themselves over their garbage can fires. You motherfucking cops always cold, even in the summer, one of the young fucks said to us. Both Samson and I laughed. We finally trudged back toward our car around six. We were beaten up. We'd blown a long day. Nothing good had come of it. Gary Sinegi had disappeared into thin air again. I felt as if I were in a horror movie. Want to go out a few extra blocks? I asked Samson. I was feeling desperate enough to try the slot machines in Atlantic City. Sinegi was playing with us. Maybe he was watching us. Maybe the fucker was invisible. Samson shook his head. No more, sugar. I want to drink at least a case of brew. Then I might just do some serious drinking. He wiped slush off his sunglasses, then put them on again. It's weird how well I know his every move. He's been dusting his glasses like that since he was twelve. Through rain or sleet or snow. Let's do the extra blocks, I said. For Ms. Vivian. Least we can do. I knew you were going to say that. We filed into the apartment of a Mrs. Quilly McBride at around 6.20 that night. Quilly and her friend Mrs. Scott were seated at the kitchen table. Mrs. Scott had something to tell us that she thought might help. We were there to listen to anything she had to say. If you ever go through D.C. Southeast or the north section of Philadelphia or Harlem in New York on a Sunday morning, you'll still see ladies like Mrs. McBride and her friend Willie May Randall Scott. These ladies wear blousy shirts and faded gabardine skirts. Their usual accoutrements include feathered hats and thick-heeled lace-up shoes that bunch their feet like sausage links. They are coming or going from various churches. In the case of Willie May, who is a Jehovah's Witness, they distribute the Watchtower magazine. I believe I can help y'all, Mrs. Scott said to us in a soft, sincere voice. She was probably eighty years old but very focused and clear in her delivery. We'd appreciate that, I said. The four of us sat around the kitchen table. A plate of oatmeal cookies had been set out for the occasion of anyone's visit. A triptych with photos of the two murdered Kennedys and Martin Luther King was prominent on a kitchen wall. I heard about the murder of the teacher, Mrs. Scott said for Samson's and my benefit, and, well, I saw a man driving around the neighborhood a month or so before the Turner murders. He was a white man. I am fortunate to still have a very good memory. I try to keep it that way by concentrating on whatever passes before these eyes. Ten years from today, I will be able to recall this interview on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, detectives. Her friend Mrs. McBride had pulled her chair beside Mrs. Scott. She didn't speak at first, though she did take Mrs. Scott's bulging arm in her hand. It's true, she will, Quilly McBride said. One week before the Turner murders, the same white man came through the neighborhood again, Mrs. Scott continued. This second time, he was going door to door. He was a salesman. Samson and I looked at each other. What kind of salesman, Samson asked her. Mrs. Scott allowed her eyes to drift over Samson's face before she answered the question. I figured she was concentrating, making sure she remembered everything about him. He was selling heating systems for the winter. I went over by his car and looked inside. A sales book of some sort was on the front seat. His company is called Atlantic Heating, out of Wilmington, Delaware. Mrs. Scott looked from face to face, either to make sure that she was being clear or that we were getting all of what she had just said. Yesterday, I saw the same car drive through the neighborhood. I saw the car the morning the woman on C Street was killed, I said to my friend here. This can't all be a coincidence, can it? Now, I don't know if he's the one you're looking for, but I think you should talk to him. Samson looked at me. Then the two of us did a rare thing of late. We broke into smiles. Even the ladies decided to join in. We had something. We had a break. Finally, the first of the case. We're going to talk to the traveling salesman, I said to Mrs. Scott and Quilly McBride. We're going to Wilmington, Delaware. Chapter 36 Gary Murphy got home at a little past five on the following afternoon, January 14. He'd gone into the office just outside Wilmington. 
Only a few people had been there.